she'll still be my star Baby, cause in the dark You can't see shiny cars And that's when you need me here With you all always share Because when the sun shines We'll shine together Told you I'd be here forever Said I'll always be your friend Took a note, I'm sticking out to the end Now when it's raining Saturday night. She happens to be the halftime show uh, tomorrow on the Super Bowl, in case you were wondering what's up. Uh, hey, welcome to Terra Nova. Great to see you guys on a Super Bowl weekend. Got a great weekend planned for you. Kicking off a new series. And uh, we're going to begin, as we often do, not singing Rihanna, but uh, a couple of other really great songs. Because what we like to do as we gather is sing some songs that help us focus our hearts and our attentions and our minds on things that are truer than some of the things that have been assaulting our heads and our senses during the week. And, and so I want to invite you to jump up as the band leads us. This next song is called Higher. And uh, it's one of my favorites. It just invites us to, uh, to reflect on how God, good, good God has been. So why don't you jump up on your feet, put your hands together with us as the band leads us. Thanks for being here today. Out of the darkness, out of the shadow 
song to sing, but a powerful truth to remember. 
Hey, I want to welcome you to Terra Nova. My name is Scott. This is Ashley. We're so glad that you're with us today. And uh, before you take a seat, we actually got a question for you. Absolutely. You might know it is Super Bowl weekend. Mm. I think I'm allowed to say that up here. So we're really excited. And we want to know what are you most looking forward to or yes. rooting for? Is it the Chiefs? Is it the Eagles? Is it the halftime show? Maybe commercials mm -hmm. or the food? So we would love for you to just take a chance to meet someone next to you, say hi, and ask them that question. So go ahead, go find ahead. somebody, ask them that question, go for it. Oh, you know, it is a great weekend when we got jock jams Thank going. Wow. Very, very good. All right, Ashley, you tossed out this question. Who are we rooting for? Ashley, what, what do you care about most related to the Super Bowl? I think we forgot a category, which is the Puppy Bowl. Oh, the Puppy Ew. Bowl. Anybody watching the Puppy Bowl this weekend? I'm watching the Puppy Cause, Bowl. Because okay. barely she is. They, the Chargers let you down, but the puppies never let you down. So it's Very I've good. Learned. Very yeah. good. Well, we are so glad that you're hanging with us tonight. We're uh, actually going to have a fun little party afterwards. Yeah. We're going to have Buffalo Wild Wings next Yum. door. By the way, anybody like Buffalo Wild Wings? Anyone? Kind of like this guy does. Uh, you like football oh. and Wild Wings. There you go, a little gift card. Oh. Anybody else like Wild Wings? Now you do. Now you do, apparently. Oh. There you go. Oh, Picking wow. up on it. Well, a great weekend Yum. all around. We're kicking off a new series uh, in just a few minutes. Great stuff going on for the kids, but we are just so glad that you're with us. And if you're with us and it's one of the first times that you're here, or maybe yeah. your first time this evening, we just want to pause and thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you for being with us. There's a million things you could be doing this weekend. And the fact that you're hanging with us and you're giving this an opportunity, we just want to thank you for being our guest. We hope you have a great experience with us this evening. Absolutely. And we don't always use you to wear jerseys. So just so you know, if you're a guest, do. don't, this is not a normal thing. It's fun, but it's not normal for us. So don't be freaked out. But we're so excited <laughs> you're here this weekend. If you came in, you got something that we like to call our weekend program. So if you can take that out, you can download the Terra Nova app. We also have a lot of fun things on there as well. You'll see that we have so many cool things coming up. You can take out this bright green flyer. Beautiful. We have a Terranova tour coming up. Women's retreat should be so much fun. I'm yes. so pumped for that. But if you go to the back, you'll actually see something that we look forward to filling out every weekend, and that is our Terranova Connect card. Mm -hmm. And you just do a little rip out. This is also on the Terranova app. What I love about this is it gives you the opportunity to fill out a prayer request. You can write down anything that you're interested in. There's lots of boxes on here to check off if you're just trying to find out more information. Whether you're a guest or you've been here forever, this is something that we fill out every weekend, and we really love to get these back and read through them and pray for you. So we would love for you to fill this out. You can maybe write down what you think the score of the Super Bowl would be. I don't know. We'll send you to the Super Bowl next year if you get it right. Oh, will we? No. Yeah. Okay. okay. Never mind. I don't cool. think we can pull that off. We, we we'll will. We'll pray about it. We will. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Like, like she's saying, we love to, to hear from everybody. So you could spend a moment doing this. Feel free to share as much or as little as you feel comfortable with sharing. We just love to hear from you. And uh, one of the things that we're going to do this weekend is uh, for every single Connect card that gets filled out, whether it's on the app, it's online, it's a physical card, we're going to make a $5 donation on your behalf. We've got some great organizations we're partnering with that mm -hmm. are working to provide relief uh, for those impacted by the earthquake in Absolutely. the Turkey, Syria area. And so we just said, hey, let's just all get on board with that. So even if before you're like, I'm not going to fill that out. Now you're going, yeah, I'm yeah. absolutely going to because I want to be a part of, of providing aid and help there. So spend a little bit of time working on that Connect card. Yeah, and there's something else that we'd just love for you to take a chance to look at as well, and that's our volunteer menu. Yeah. And as a community, we really desire it to be a place where you can come with your contributions, with your gifts, and be able to make a real impact every single weekend. And this is something that we open up only a couple times a year, but I really love that part about it because you can try out different things that you want to volunteer in and just use your gifts in and different ministries. And so we really love that we're able to do this a couple times a year and we just started off our signups. And so if you want to pull out your volunteer money, you can just check out all the different ways. Yeah, you'll, you'll pull it out. You'll see it's set up like a menu at a restaurant. So you go, oh, starters, those are great for me to jump into if I'm new mm -hmm. at this. Side dishes, I could get a few of those things. Mm -hmm. One of the things I heard is that Super Bowl weekend calories don't count. So this is yep. a great opportunity to them. say, hey, I want to jump into a bunch of these. All How specialties? Yes. Normally I do one main course, but this weekend, maybe All I do more them. than that. Yeah. Uh, but, but jokes aside, uh, one of the things that we know is not only is serving just a, a fun way to jump in, have a great time, it helps us make connections, form some friendships. Uh, it is a great way to utilize some of the gifts or the opportunities we've been given and just serve. But it really feels like fulfilling when we're able to, to sense that we're actually making a difference for people in our lives. Yeah. And that's what we like. And just having the opportunity to do that together. And it really, it drives home this theme of like really being a team and doing that together. And so this weekend, take some time, find an area or two 
two that you can jump into. You'll see on the back of this, there's a quick little form that you could fill out. You can also do this on the app or online, yep. but we would love just to be this beautiful community where we're all jumping in and getting in the game. Yeah, we're so excited just to see the different ways we're all able to serve together. And we're really excited for this weekend. It's a really big weekend. This is a full house, lots of wings afterwards. We're so pumped you're here <laughs> for these super Saturday night as we brand it. The kids are having a blast already. And we're just so pumped to jump into our new series, Investigating Jesus. So when it comes to knowing if there is a God or what God is like or who God likes, does it really all just come down to, well, the Bible says, the Bible says, or other religious, ancient religious literature says, and others, when it comes to questions about faith or struggles of faith, or how can I know, or I'm just not sure, or how could I be sure, is really the best answer, the only answer we really have. Well, I guess you just, I guess you just have to believe these ancient, ancient texts. And, and I mean, come on, like as modern people, are we really supposed to place uncritical faith in a collection of ancient manuscripts written by dozens of men over hundreds of years of history in a world without science where everybody believed in the gods and spirits and fate and, and the forces of faith. I mean, come on, like, weren't they just guessing? Weren't they just kind of making stuff up and hoping it was true? Weren't they just like looking at the clouds and, and weather patterns and, and nature and the randomness of life and trying to make sense out of things that just didn't make sense and sometimes just don't make sense? And is that really like the best we got? Is that the best, like, which is a little like just have faith in faith or just believe in belief or try harder to believe. And if so, if that is the best we've got, then if someone struggles with faith, with holding on to maybe the faith or the beliefs that they once held as a child, if somebody has like questions, like hard questions, doubts, maybe even walks away or pulls away or maybe even just dismisses faith and the idea of God and the idea that there's anything more to this life than this life dismisses it altogether, should we really be surprised? Should we really be surprised if the best we got is, well, the Bible says, and you just need to have faith in faith, we shouldn't be surprised that anybody might come to a point in their life where they would maybe shrug that off or walk away from that. I mean, think about it this way. If, if the Christian faith really just bounces kind of precariously on the edge of questionable ancient writings by superstitious men, then why not? Why not if you come to a point in your life where that doesn't make sense anymore? Why not? walk away from it. But as it turns out, and maybe this will be new news for you, maybe some of what we talk about today will be new news. As it turns out, this is actually not the case, and it was certainly not at all the originally the case for the followers of Jesus. And the followers of Jesus did not expect people, and followers of Jesus are not expected to just believe, to just believe based on a collection of ancient writings written over hundreds of years of history, often hundreds of years, as, they, as is sometimes said, after the facts that they describe at a time when everybody believed in the gods and everybody was superstitious and there was no modern science. In fact, the real foundation of the Jesus movement and why someone might decide to actually follow Jesus as they did is anchored in something much more sustainable than that, much more substantial than that, anchored in something that's even investigable, which is actually a word. 
I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't find it doesn't it doesn't roll off the tongue correctly. In fact, say it out loud with me. One, two, three. See, it's just wrong. It sounds wrong. It feels wrong. I much prefer the word investigatable, which is actually not a word, (laughs) unfortunately. But the foundation of the Jesus movement and the foundation of deciding whether, whether a person might actually trust and might actually even follow Jesus is investigable, which may be new news to you. It might be an idea that you've not ever heard before or not really ever processed or considered before. And here's what that means. That means you're invited to kick the tires. You're invited to ask questions, hard questions, to dig deeper, to probe deeper. And for those of us who have decided to follow Jesus, it means we don't have to shrug and say, well, it's a mystery and who could ever know? I mean, no one can possibly know. You just have to believe. You just got to have faith. Investigable. Investigable. And here's the reason why. The Christian faith, and this is somewhat unique, and again, maybe you've never really considered this or thought about this, does not actually rise and fall on the accuracy of Bible stories in ancient texts. The Christian faith, the Jesus movement, rises and falls on something that happened something that happened in history and specifically someone, the identity and events surrounding a single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. But I know what you're probably thinking, you're like, okay, time out, time out, see right there. Doesn't, doesn't that just take us back to where we started? I mean, doesn't that just take us back to believing in Bible stories and questionable ancient writings written hundreds of years after the event? I mean, that's what I've heard. And how can we even know for sure that there there even was a person named Jesus? Isn't he just a myth that evolved over hundreds of years to help people with what they were going through in life? Well, contrary to what what you may have heard or may have never heard, there are actually multiple historical sources that point to and refer to Uh, this person in history. The events of his life happen to take place during a time of of great literary activity. Philosophers and poets and playwrights and imperial propagandists just pouring out letters and treatises and books and scripts and so forth. And a happy coincidence of all of that literary activity is that there are numerous sources and numerous writings both inside and outside of the Bible that directly mention and or corroborate the details of the life and story of Jesus from Greek sources and Roman sources and Jewish sources and, of course, from ancient Christian sources too. For example, I'll just give you an example of this. Without even cracking open a Bible or any writing of any early follower of Jesus, here's what we could know about this individual from outside sources. The name, Jesus, the place and time of his public life, Galilee and Judea during the the governorship of Pontius Pilate between AD 26 and AD 36, the name of his mother, Mary, the questionable, even scandalous nature of his birth, the, the name of at least one of his brothers, James, his fame as a teacher, his fame as, as a miracle worker slash sorcerer. Because again, these are not necessarily believing sources or believing authors, but there was, there was a known inexplicable power that seemed to surround the stories of this individual. The attribution of, to him of the title Messiah or Christ or anointed king, the kingly status In the eyes of some, his execution by crucifixion around the time of the Passover festival, the involvement of both Roman and Jewish leaders in his death, the coincidence of an eclipse at the time of his crucifixion, the reports of Jesus' appearance to his followers and to others after his death, and the flourishing of a movement that followed him and even worshiped him after his death. All of that from sources outside of the Bible. Now, That's a lot, but hands down, the most thorough and actually the most respected sources about Jesus for all historians, believing and skeptical and in between, are actually the four biographies of Jesus written by his early followers, four documents that are sometimes known as the Gospels. Maybe you've heard of that term before. Gospel comes from an ancient English, Anglo-Saxon word, good spell, which means good news. And, and these are all examples of ancient biographies. And it's really quite amazing. 
There are four of them, not one, four accounts that trace the life and the teachings and the impact and especially the completely unforeseen events surrounding the end of his life. Four biographies written, by the way, not centuries after the fact. And maybe that's what you heard or maybe saw that or heard that in school or like an English professor or something like that. That was actually a popular theory about 75 years ago uh, in some strains of scholarship and historical studies that these documents come out of the second century or so. It was popularized again by uh, Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code, added with a little conspiracy theory. And who doesn't love a good conspiracy theory, right? But the evidence to the contrary, the evidence, the evidence that these were actually written around the time of the events is so overwhelming now and so compelling that I don't actually know of a single historian or scholar respected of that era of time. Now, they might be out there. I may, there might be some I haven't read, but I don't know of a single, a single respected historian or scholar of that era who places any of these documents outside of the first century within the lifetime of the original followers of Jesus. Four biographies that are known by the names of their authors who were believed from very earliest days to have written them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, here's what that means, and then we'll dive in a little bit further. And, and, and this is a bit of where we're going in, in this series. If you're curious about faith, or if you're returning to faith, or if you're wondering, or, uh, wondering about faith, or perhaps even losing your faith or losing interest in faith, here's what I think. Just I think, here's the question to really wrestle with. And it's not, is there or is there not a God? And it's not, can I really trust the Bible or is the Bible true? I mean, there's a lot of things in the Bible. I don't know about that six days of creation thing. I don't know, can I trust the Bible? I don't know if that's actually the best question. I think here's the question. And this actually is investigable, if you will. And the question is this, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, not Anne, not all four, but any one of the four, a reliable account of actual events. Is Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John a reliable account of actual events or not? Because if they are, if they are even essentially accurate or basically reliable, then what they say about Jesus is true, well, then it's game on. Faith on, press on. You should lean in and you should investigate. And here's where, here's where we're going. Over the next few weeks, we're going to explore one of these four. The, the one that was written by a man we know of as Luke. It's sometimes called the good news according to Luke. And Luke, he's got an interesting backstory because Luke was not a Jewish guy. He was not one of the OGs. He was not an original follower of Jesus. It's like he's not invested in the story. He has no reason for it to want it to be true or not true. Uh, he's a physician, which means he's a highly educated individual. And he actually became a follower of Jesus after the movement had begun to spread. He became a companion of Paul. And maybe you've heard of Paul or St. Paul or the apostle. Paul, a close companion of Paul, widely traveled. Physicians in general traveled far more than the average person in the ancient world. And the leaders of the Jesus movement were by and large widely traveled as well. And so he's widely traveled. He's well known in all of the early Jesus communities. He's the contemporary of all of the eyewitnesses, which means Luke knew Peter, talked with Peter, knew James, the brother of Jesus, knew John and Paul and Philip and Silas and Mary and Mark and all of the others. And it turns out Luke is a remarkably accurate historian to the extent to which in his two volume work, uh, as he gives details about the ancient world that conflict with some other sources, there are many historians who would bet the farm on Luke rather than a other historian because his, his record is just so solid. He's just very accurate and very meticulous in being accurate. And he's the author of a two volume history or a work. Uh, the first of which is the gospel or the good news according to Luke. This is, this is the story of Jesus. And the second volume is known as the act of the apostles, what happened after Jesus died as the movement began to explode. And he addresses his two-volume history 
as we'll find out, uh, to a man named Theophilus. Now, Theophilus was very clearly a a wealthy, very powerful, uh, and perhaps a very high-ranking Roman official, and he had evidently begun to follow Jesus, as many, many people were, and embraced this new way of living, this new way of being, and Luke addresses this two-volume work of history to Theophilus. And the reason why we named the series Investigating Jesus The reason why is because of how Luke introduces his account of Jesus to Theophilus and to us. Now, as a young follower of Jesus, I became a follower of Jesus in a drug rehab in my late teens. And, and I mean, I dove in headlong. And I, as, I, as, a, as a young teen or a late teen or in early 20s, I remember just reading about Jesus. I was so fascinated. He was a very fascinating person to me, trying to figure him out. And the writings of his first followers, they just seemed so convinced. It wasn't like, uh, we just believe this is true and this is what we believe. Leave, they were so convinced of their story. And I remember thinking, that would be awesome to be that convinced, to be that certain if I could only go back and investigate myself and actually be there on the ground and see firsthand or have conversations with those who did see firsthand, firsthand accounts. But like, I can't do that. Have you ever wished you could? I can't do that. I wish I could. And so I remember thinking, if there was somebody else that I could trust, if there was somebody I could trust to have been impartial because they got no dog in the hunt, they got no reason for, to want it to be true and was like as skeptical and as critical and as questioning as I am who would ask the tough questions and cross check answers, who could like be my surrogate if I can't be there, if only there was somebody else who could have been. And then I read Luke's introduction. Dr. Luke, not OG follower of Jesus, his introduction, the way he began his account of Jesus's life. And here's how it starts. Many, many. Now, how many is many? Is many one? Is it three? Is it 10? Is it 100? Kind of depends on what you're talking about, right? Is it how many kids do you have or how many stars are in the sky? That's a very different many. But how many is many? Many, many, he says. Many have undertaken, because it's effortful, it's hard, it's difficult, to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, there are things that have happened. There are events that are recordable, and, and those events are actually a fulfillment of something else, like an even bigger story, if you will. And Luke is saying, by the time he's writing this, he already knows that many others have undertaken and are undertaking this process. And he's assuming that Theophilus and the communities that he's writing to, that they're aware of this as as well, that there are already documents and collections about Jesus and what he did and what he said already circulating the Jesus communities at the time, including Mark's story of Jesus's life, who tells Peter's story, but others as well. And this is really amazing. This is truly an amazing just kind of oddity of history because you know, do you know how many will undertake to draw up an account of your life or my life? You know how many? Not (laughs) many. Not many, right? Like the only people who will even know we were here after our kids and grandkids have, have, have passed on is not many. Not many. Unless you have done something incredibly good or incredibly bad, it's just not many, right? And not many undertook to drop an account of anyone in the ancient world because writing was incredibly expensive and difficult and arduous, it was all done by hand and books were published and copied by hand. It was uh, was expensive, it was difficult. In fact, get this, the Roman emperor during the time of of Jesus, uh, Tiberius Caesar, the most powerful man in the known world, not a single account drawn up of his life. Nobody undertook to draw up an account of Tiberius. Lots of references to him, no biography of his life. Virtually nothing is written about Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in Jerusalem and Judea during the time of Jesus' death. We know a lot about Herod the Great. He did a lot of great things, but there is actually no biography of Herod the Great's life. No one undertook to draw up that account. And do you know all together how many detailed accounts we have of the lives of common first century carpenters or crucified rebels or first century rabbis? How many biographies? Calculate them all together. Zero. 
None. There are quotes, there are references, there are stories, but nothing that's even close to what we have for Jesus of Nazareth. That's curious, isn't it? We have four, four very thorough, very carefully thought out and written biographies. And Luke is already aware as he's writing that others, like there are documents already circling many, many, many. He says, why? Why many? Why even one? Seriously, let alone more than one. And why would Luke, especially knowing that others are already undertaking it, why would Luke or anyone take the time and the effort and the expense to document the life of a common carpenter turned rabbi who was crucified as a rebel by the state? Why? And the answer is because something extraordinary had happened. Something extraordinary had happened. Not just something life-changing. Those things happen often. Not, something that was game-changing, that was actually history-changing. But not just something extraordinary. Something good had happened. Something that was truly good had happened, and it had happened for the entire world. And so Luke was compelled to tell the story. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled. Get this, among us, this is, he's saying to Theophilus, this is our generation. This is, our, this is during our lifetimes. Now, this too is amazing because ancient history was so often written generations and generations after the events but not so with this Jesus of Nazareth. This, Luke is saying, this is our lifetime. This has happened. We know the people. Luke knew the men and women who had played key roles, and Theophilus probably knew a few of them as well. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, this was exactly the work of a historian in the ancient world. This is not one upon, once upon a time in a land far, far away. This is not fairy tale. This is not how fiction was written. This is how serious professional writings and serious histories were written in the ancient world to do the hard, expensive, and dangerous work of travel because traveling was a dangerous, dangerous thing. You had your life in your hands all the time to go to places and see for oneself and to find and search out those who had actually actually been there and get their stories and ask clarifying questions and then cross check their stories with other people's stories, determining the accuracy of what you were being told. That was the work of a historian in the ancient world. And that's exactly what Luke says he did. With this in mind, he says, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And we can safely assume by the time that, that Luke finally decides to sit down and start writing it all up and crafting this and, and pulling this together, that he's been carefully investigating everything. He's been doing that for like years, C certainly decades. He had traveled, first of all, with Paul extensively. So that means he personally had met many of the women and the men who had been part of the movement from the very beginning, those who were following Jesus when Jesus was still uh, walking around. And he had met Peter at Antioch, which history tells us Luke had been born, was born and raised in Antioch. Antioch was the site of the first citywide multi-ethnic Jesus movement explosion. And that is no doubt where Luke had begun to follow Jesus. Jesus, and Peter had visited there, and Paul had spent time there, which is no doubt how he had picked up the trail with Paul, and he had had an opportunity to listen to Peter's stories and ask questions of Peter, and then Luke had no doubt sat down in John's home in Ephesus, where John was caring for Jesus' mother Mary until she died. Can you imagine that? And interviewing the two of them over like dinners and meals for days. Can you imagine interviewing Mary? And like having question after question, like, so wait, 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 wait. Tell me again how you first found out. Like, what was that like? And he had interviewed her, but he didn't just interview Mary. Uh, Luke knew James, the brother of Jesus, who was not a fan of Jesus during Jesus's lifetime. And Luke knew Cleopas, who was Joseph, as in Mary and Joseph's 
brother, Jesus' like step uncle or uncle in law, if you will, or step uncle, yeah, step uncle, Cleopas, Jesus' brother, who became part of the Jesus movement from the very early days and had actually seen Jesus after his resurrection on the road to a town called Emmaus. And so talking with Mary and James and Cleopas and others, he's like getting the inside family dirt. So tell like, what was he like as a preteen, you know? And he ends up telling some very intimate stories from their perspective. And Luke had spoken with Joanne who was a very powerful, wealthy woman, the wife of Cusa, who was one of uh, Herod's managers and one of the earliest disciples who had followed Jesus, ended up, ends up in Rome as part of the Jesus community there. And she had been there at the cross with a few others, with Mary of Magdala and Susanna. And she had seen the empty tomb and he had, like, and, G- and, and Luke names again and again, this, his sources, his eyewitnesses in the biography that he writes. And he says, since I've been doing this, I've been doing this there as long as I can remember. I've been doing this for years carefully and accurately. So then I too decided to, to write an orderly account for you and to bring it all together, all of this information and bring it in, into an accurate narrative for you, most excellent Theophilus. And then this next line is so powerful. This, this next line is so important. And this is, this is the line that grabbed me as a young man. So, so that you may know the certainty. So that you may know the certainty of the things that you taught. Like you've been heard, you've heard stories and you've had some of these OG Jesus followers pass through your community and you've heard them tell stories and you've been taught things, but I want you to know the backstory and I want you to know the history and I want you to know it with accuracy. I want you to have confidence, complete confidence in what you have been told about Jesus. Now get this. Luke, as he does this, he is not writing Bible stories for the Bible. There was no the Bible as Luke is writing this. The Bible wouldn't come along for a very long time after this. And we don't take Luke seriously. And they didn't take Luke seriously because it was in the Bible because there was no the Bible. Luke is not writing the Bible. He's writing history. He's writing what he knows to be history during the time when that history had actually happened. And he's writing it to be thorough and accurate and reliable, documenting the life and the teaching and the surprising ending of the life of Jesus because he wanted those like Theophilus, like Theophilus who were, who were beginning to follow Jesus, who had questions, legitimate questions, but they, they couldn't be there, like they couldn't go back. They couldn't have seen it with their own eyes and they couldn't necessarily even do the investigative work to follow up for themselves because it was so hard and so complicated. And he wanted people like Theophilus and people like me and people like you to know with certainty, to know with certainty. He he wanted them and us to know the certainty of what we've been taught, to have absolute confidence in the accuracy of the story that he is about to tell. And his two-volume work would then be copied and copied and copied and copied and read always aloud in communities, always aloud as groups gathered around and they would process it out loud together as it was read slowly and they would think it through and it would be stored away so carefully, often out of sight because these documents over time became illegal during the first few centuries and people could get killed for even having them. They were like what Russian dissidents during the Cold War called Samizdat, this dissident underground literature that would be handwritten and hand copied and passed from person to person because you knew they were okay to give it to. And these documents would be spread and spread around and then collected. And and these little Jesus communities, they would would begin to have one or two or three or four. Maybe they'd have a couple of the letters of Paul. I mean, oh my gosh, a letter from Paul or from Peter or John or James. And then maybe they would have... Mark's biography of Jesus's life, or maybe Luke's, or maybe over time they would find, they, they would hear, there's another biography. It's written by Matthew. John has written a biography. Like, can we get that? Can we send a scribe to copy that out and bring that back to our community? And those documents would be collected and collected and collected. And eventually all of those collections were brought together and the documents that were known by their provenance to have come from the very first century from the eyewitnesses themselves were included in a collection of documents that would become known as the New Covenant or the New Testament, which did then get matched up with the Hebrew scriptures that they also poured through and knew so well and treasured so much. And together, they would eventually be called Tabiblia, the books, 
just the books. And because of its providence, and because it was, its providence was so easily confirmed through a very clear train of those who knew what was what, and because of the accuracy, and because it was investigable, Luke's two-volume history was included in the books as well. And here's what that means. This is at least part of what that means. We don't take Luke seriously because it's in the Bible. We don't take Luke seriously because it's Bible stories that are in the Bible, and we don't believe it because it's in the Bible, and we believe the Bible, so we believe Luke. And if you don't believe the Bible, then I guess I don't know if you can believe it. We don't believe it because it's in the Bible. It's actually the other way around. Let me put it to you this way, because that might work on one level, and I think it does. Like, hey, I believe this, these documents are inspired by God, and so I lean into them in a different way than I lean into other things. And that, that works very well on one level and for some people, but that's not what historians do. And that's not what scholars do. And by the way, that's not what skeptics do and questioners do. And that's not what investigators do. That's not quite enough. And so here's what you need to know. We don't take Luke seriously because it was included in the Bible. It's the other way around. Luke's account of the life of Jesus was included in the Bible because Luke's account of the life of Jesus was known to be reliable when it was written, before there ever was of the Bible. Let me say that again. Luke's account of the life of, uh, of Jesus was included in the Bible precisely because his account was known to be reliable when it was written. And Luke is writing history. He's writing history about something that happened, about someone who had happened, something extraordinary had happened, something game-changing and history-changing had happened, something good had happened, and it had happened for the entire world. And he claims that he's investigated that, that he's done the investigative journalist approach. He's talked with the eyewitness. He's kicked the tires, and he has finally written an accurate and orderly account, which is exactly what good historians did in the first century world. So so the question really becomes this. I, I think, like, if you're struggling or, or fa- with faith or maybe considering faith or moving towards faith or maybe even moving away from faith, the question really comes down to this. Is Luke's account accurate? Is it or is it not? Is it reliable? Or is Luke lying? Is Luke lying? And in fact, are, are all of his sources Lying, and lying consistently, by the way, and are, is Luke and, his, and are his, his, his sources lying while telling a story that raises the bar on goodness and generosity and love and integrity and humility and honesty and grace higher than that bar has ever been raised before while beginning a movement that transformed the social order, that flipped the social ladder, elevating the poor and elevating women and outsiders and slaves and children and challenging the powerful like Theophilus, to live with self-sacrificial humility and servanthood while experiencing persecution and opposition and misunderstanding and sometimes even death for doing so, is Luke lying or is Luke accurate? See, he either carefully investigated everything from the beginning or he didn't. And here's what I love about Luke, because I can't do this for myself. He's not vested. He's not invested. It doesn't matter to his life whether the story is true or not. He's not one of the original followers of Jesus trying to keep this thing alive, like we had a good thing going, we don't want to let it die. That's not Luke. He's not invested in that. He just wants to know the truth, because if this is true, it changes everything. When it's not true, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. This is not just have faith in faith and just try to believe and you need to just believe and it's a mystery and I guess we'll never know. Luke would never, ever say such a thing. He wants to know with certainty and with accuracy what he has been told and he wants others to know that as well and he wants you to know that as well. So as we wrap up episode one of Investigating Jesus, I want to leave you with this. If you choose not to follow Jesus because it's inconvenient, I get that. It is. It just straight is. Following Jesus will require something from you. It will require something of you. It will require you to forgive 
people who do not deserve to be forgiven and it'll feel like you're giving them a gift after they took something from you. It's like, that's not even fair. That doesn't even feel right. And it's gonna require you to be, to be less selfish, to be less full of yourself, even at times when you just so feel like you should be making it about you and you can't and you want to. And over time, people might think you're weird for that. People might think you're weak for that or soft for that. It's going to require you to be more generous than you ever thought you should be. I mean, after all, you're not rich and you need your money. And he's challenging you to open your hands for somebody who has less than you, and there's always somebody who has less than you. It's going to require you to bite your tongue when you so want to let that loose. It's going to require you to tolerate and endure people you want to cancel, and more than that, to actually be gracious and loving towards people who do not deserve it. It's gonna require integrity and humility and honesty that goes beyond the norm. And we can just go on and on and on. Following Jesus will require something of you and it will require something from you. And if you say, I'm not doing that, I don't care whether it's true or not. I'm not doing it. That's too much. That costs too much. That costs, that's going to cost me too much time. It's going to cost me too much face. It's going to cost me too much ego. It's going to cost me too much. I, like, no, thank you. I don't care if it's true. If that's what you decide, I get that. I get that. That's your choice. However, I will just throw this in there. If you do decide to follow Jesus, and I mean really follow him, if you, just, if you choose to follow Jesus, I will tell you this. Following Jesus will make your life better and it will make you better at life. It will make your life better, not easier, not necessarily funner, but it'll make it better and it'll make you better at life. And that's a guarantee. And it will not always be convenient and it won't be easy and it certainly won't always be self-gratifying. And if you opt out of that, I, I get it because there is a cost, but... Please, 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 please do not choose not to follow Jesus because you don't think there's anything to the story of Jesus. Please don't decide not to follow Jesus because you don't think there's any truth to the story of Jesus because despite what you may have heard in high school English class or in some college course or on YouTube or in culture, there is, and it is investigable. And don't walk away from that or don't pass on following Jesus until you have investigated for yourself as an adult. Because this, like if Luke was right, if he is even mostly right, if his investigative work is fairly accurate, and not just Luke, if Mark and Peter and Paul and John and Mary and Joanna and Susanna and Cleopas and James and Philip and on and on dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of others eyewitnesses, if they were right, then, then don't you think you owe it to yourself to know the certainty, to investigate for yourself? Because something extraordinary happened. Something almost unbelievable happened. Something good happened, and it happened for the whole world. And everybody needs to know, Luke thought. And so after decades of investigating and compiling, Luke finally picks up his pen and begins to write his account from the beginning, the account of who Jesus of Nazareth was and what he taught and what he did and the surprising ending of his life. And we will pick the story up right there next week on part two of investigating Jesus, how we know and why we follow. I hope you'll come back. Don't miss it. Let me close this in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to, just personally, just for myself, thank you for Luke. Thank you for Luke. Thank you for his story, his journey. And thank you so much for inspiring him for inspiring him just through his own maybe curious and even skeptical personality to investigate, to cross-reference, to ask questions, to pursue, to pursue, pursue, and then to compile and put together an orderly account of the life that changed the world. And so I, I pray for myself, I pray for really for all of us as we head into these next few weeks and just dive into this series and these stories that for each one of us, wherever we're at on the spiritual spectrum of things, 
you would help us like see something in a new light or, or come to some more clarity or, or really perhaps take a next step in our journey of following Jesus, which is certainly what Luke is hoping we will do. And I pray that for all of us in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for uh, joining us here as we're kicking off this new series. By the way, uh, if you got anything out of today or uh, you want to see it again, you want to like double check some of that, maybe even fact check, like what, what was that and how can I look that up? You can watch this again and you can share it with somebody who you think, hey, maybe they should get in on this. And you could, and you could do so using our YouTube channel, youtube.com. Just put in our Terranova, one word, our Terranova, and you can share that. And speaking of sharing this, uh, as you come back next week, why not invite somebody with you? You'll see these little cards on chairs all around you. Grab one or two of those and bring somebody else back that you think might enjoy or benefit from this series beginning next week. Uh, also, before you head out, please, please, please take a moment to fill out that Connect card. Uh, and if you'd like to jump in on our next Terra Nova Tours where we talk about who we are and why we do what we do, you can write Tour Me on there, Free Lunch, Free Child Care, write Tour Me, tour me somewhere. Uh, and of course, uh, for every card filled out, we're going to be giving $5 to um, Turkey and Syria Earthquake Relief and we want to write a big fat check to some organizations that we love that are already on the ground working there. So please uh, don't forget to turn those in, hand those in on the baskets on your way out. Love to hear from you and get to know you better. You can also throw that serving menu in there. Even if you're not using it, you can recycle it that way, or you can take it home, use the QR code, and you can sign up to serve online. You can actually order online because we're like that. Uh, and of course, you can give using the offering envelope on your way out. We believe generosity changes the world. And you can set up recurring giving very easily online or on our app, and you can give on Venmo as well at our Terra Nova. So uh, all of that going on, but uh, you can hand all that in on your way out. Please join us again next week for part two of our series, Investigating Jesus. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic Super Bowl weekend. We'll see you next week.